Ready. Okay, hi guys, thanks for joining us um, on Friday evening. Um, we're going to run through um, basically an overview of the um, radiology application this year, um, some predictions, um, some look back at what um, how they ran the process last year and um, see how they said it's going to change this year and as I say, make some predictions as to how it's going to run. Um, so we're going to go through the recruitment timeline, um, major changes from last year, look at competition ratios, um, talk about the MSRA, the interview um, process, uh, the self-assessment portfolio, um, and then um, just have have a chat, uh, some Q and A at the end about other um, changes to the to the um, that might be coming for next year's cycle as well. Um, what we're not going to cover, we're not going to um, cover the Northern Ireland application. It's a different um, application um, cycle altogether. Um, we're not going to go into the academic clinical fellowship. Um, you can contact us separately about that. We're not going to also not going to go into the direct ST3 um, application. Again, just drop us an email um, if you want to talk about that separately. Um, and um, we're also not going to talk about why our first specialties hate radiology for being the best because haters are going to hate. So um, some of you have already asked about this. This is the recruitment timeline. Um, it's present on the um, recruitment website on Oriel and on the RCR website. You should all have this imprinted into your brains and um, make sure you know where all of the important dates are so you don't miss any, miss, miss any, um, miss any important um, points in this process. So um, in terms of changes this year compared to last year, um, one of the major changes, perhaps the, the biggest change, is the change uh, the difference in how they're going to be using the MSRA. So, um, or in in terms of how your overall ranking is going to be um, constructed. So, last year, um, the your final rank was made up twenty percent of the MSRA, and then thirty percent of your rank came from your portfolio score, and fifty percent of your um, final score came from the interview. Um, this year, they've actually moved the MSRA from the final score. So 40% um, of your final score is going to be coming from the portfolio and 60% of your final score is going to be coming from the interview. So the MSRA is not going to be involved in the final score, um, in, in deciding your overall, overall rank. Um, but the MSRA is still going to be used for shortlisting candidates or long listing initially. Um, so you have to get above a certain mark in order to be eligible um, to be to progress through the application process and potentially be called for interview. And then a cert, it will also be used for shortlisting. So um, it, the, the order in which you rank in the MSRA will determine the um, order in which you can potentially be called um, whether you're qualified for interview. Um, but as I said, the MSRA is not going to count towards your final rank. Um, in terms of the interview, um, just a brief overview now, we'll go into this in a little bit more detail um, later on. But um, last year, they changed up the interviews quite a lot, having kept them the same for several years before that. And so they introduced a new structure where there were two 10-minute stations um, and there was a a station where they assess commitment to specialty, which included prioritization scenarios, which is um, something that they'd reintroduced after a long time when they didn't have any prioritization in the interview. And then there was a um, 10 minute station where they assessed communication skills. Um, this year, they said they're going to keep this the same. So it's going to be the same as last year, which is useful. So you guys have a head up, heads up. Um, whereas last year, they sprang it on candidates um, quite late in the process, which wasn't very pleasant for those people preparing. This is um, just sort of a, a table which shows you the composition ratios over the last few years. And it's not so much to scare you, but just to sort of underline that, as you all know, radiology is becoming more competitive and mainly because uh, people just don't want to do anything else in the hospital. So 
and the, the deeper option is to do radiology where you can get away from a lot of the a lot of the rubbish that's the idea anyway um but yeah you can see that the composition ratios are really going up um sort of exponentially um, and last year it was 12 to 1 competition ratio um so yeah yeah you guys that are here and um sort of getting um on top of the process early on are going to put yourself in the best situation to do the best uh, position to do well and hopefully be one of those candidates that gets a number so as i've said the fra um is going to be it's still going to be used for long listing so the top 850 scores of candidate scoring candidates in the msra will be eligible for an interview and then on top of that um you will also be ranked in order of your sra score and depending on how many candidates they decide they can actually interview um your your sra score will determine whether you are one of those candidates that actually gets an interview um one thing that you do need to be aware of is that there, there is a minimum score for eligibility um, in order to be long listed. Um, it's quite low, so you need to score 201 in both sections as a minimum to be to be long listed. But yeah, that's that's a score which um, you should have no problem achieving if you prepare for it. Um, so the SRA is a computer based exam. Uh, it's originally designed for GP recruitment, but it's been used by various other specialties over the years. And the RCR started using it in 2016 um, as part of their application process. And it's um, it's uh, the exam is held at uh, a Pearson View test centre. So you actually have to go to a test centre to sit the exam. It's like sort of place where you sit your um, drive your um, drive theory driving test. It's divided into two components. You've got your professional dilemmas section. So that's 50 questions. Um, 42 of those are counted in and eight, eight of the questions are sort of pilot questions or control questions. And that part of the exam takes 95 minutes. And then you have your clinical problem solving, which is 97 questions. And 86 of those are counted and that takes 75 minutes. Um, there is no negative marking and you won't know which of the questions are pilot questions or which questions are the real one, so you have to answer them all as if they're genuine, um, they're real questions that are going to be counted. So it's important that even though it's not going to be part of your final rank, uh, you do need to take it seriously. As we say, it's going to um, decide the rank in which um, you uh, can potentially be called for interview. Um, so you want to be as high up as possible to make sure you do get an interview. Um, the cutoff score for interview has been going up every year as with all these things, just like the competition ratios, they, they seem to be getting higher and higher every year. So um, you can see there, I mean, last year the cutoff was 500, was 555, and um, who knows what it will be this year, maybe 560. Um, but it does seem that the competition does seem to be getting hotter every year. Um, and you basically need to have a good broad scope of medical knowledge it's kind of medical school finals level so if you're a, a few years removed from um, medical school then you just need to sort of brush up on that finals knowledge so some of the resources which are useful to use in preparing so it's good to read the gmc's good medical practice guidance um, and they also have resources on their website um, in terms of um, scenarios to go through, professional dilemma scenarios and ethical scenarios to get you thinking in the right frame of mind for how they want you to be answering these questions. This is um, the book that everyone, um, you probably got this when you're preparing for your um, SJT, you still do that um, at the end of medical school, um, but this is probably the best, the best book for preparing for the SJT, the Oxford um, book so if you haven't got this make sure you get a copy and deal with the exercises in it and then in terms of um, online resources we think um, MCQ Bank is uh, is good as well as PassMed those, those are both good online 
resources. Um, and then also oh, eMedica um, is also um, an online question bank, which you which we recommend. And you can use RADCAST, which is a discount code. You get a 10% discount if you use the code RADCAST. And um, that will give you a discount off of the question bank subscription. And you'll also get a 25 pound discount um, from their two day um, MSRA Crammer course. So um, make use of that if um, you wish. On top of that, we've got some of our own sort of resources out. Or Mohammed has been doing um, God's work in the background and he's um, tracked down last year's a, a very high scoring candidate um, who's an ST1 at the moment. He's called Alex, um, Alex Bow, and he scored 608 in last year's MSRA, which is a, a really high score. So Mohammed um, did an interview with him, um, asked him how he did it and the way he, he prepped for it. And that's on YouTube. So check out the Radcast um, YouTube and have a, um, have a video um, over the weekend. Now on to the interview. So um, you're going to be invited to book the interview on the 26th of February. It's the interview is going to the interviews are going to be held between the 10th and 14th of March. So the interviews are going to take place over five days um, this year. They've in the past been held over four days, but they've they've extended this so they can interview more candidates. And um, the interviews are booked on a first come first serve basis. So you want to be really um, aware of those um, of the timeline and when you're going to be expecting that um, invite to interview and book as soon as you get the notification on your Oreo account or your um, email. Um, the interviews are done virtually um, using a platform called Qpercom Recruit. And as I said, it's two 10 minute stations, um, commitment specialty and communication skills. In the commitment to specialty station, um, the a, a large chunk of this last year was the prioritization station. So um, they asked you to, uh, and the scenario is varied. Um, and we have a few of this, we have a few scenarios on the um, on our application course, but they might have asked you to rank the um, findings um, or the the priority of findings in a trauma scan and how you communicate this to the clinicians um, and various other um, scenarios. But yeah, prioritization was something that came up last year. And, and then there's the communication skill station. And this varied a lot in terms of the questions that they are. So they are some ethical scenarios. Uh, a colleague is signing up late frequently or um, a consultant is prescribing the wrong medication, how do you deal with this? And they are some of the more traditional questions, why do you want to do radiology? What have you done to demonstrate commitment? And some current events in radiology. Also ask teamwork um, questions and example questions about how you've worked in a team and just general um, communication questions and questions about skills that are appropriate for radiology. So some of the more generic questions they ask in that station. Um, and as I said, we've updated our course to reflect the new um, interview structure and um, have added new modules um, to cover prioritization. And we we had existing modules on the communication skills. So if you aren't, if you haven't signed up to our um, application course, um, it is, um, it can, we do think it's, it's very good and it covers the application process very um, thoroughly. Okay, I'll pass over to Mohammed. He'll go through the portfolio. Okay. So this is probably the thing you've all been eagerly waiting for in terms of the portfolio self-assessment. There has been changes last minute, which we have been kindly informed by yourselves, which we have taken into account. Uh, it is a bit annoying that it has happened so last minute, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, and what I want to do in the next potentially 30 minutes or so is go through the changes, outline what those significant changes are, if there are any, and outline some opportunities which you could potentially take uh, use of in the remaining time uh, for you to improve your portfolio even more. As Uzi said, 
portfolio is now worth 40%, interview is worth 60%. So every point does count and it can make up for a potentially average interview performance. So first things first, your self-assessment will be done on Oriel. It's open. So if you haven't even started your application, please do so or have a look at the uh, Oriel advert, which is available now. You'll be asked to score yourself across all the seven domains. And interestingly, this year, they've included this uh, for some of the domains, for example, commitment specialty, audit, another one. They've given you this 100 word limit, little short text box where you can kind of give a bit more meat to the bone and outline why you think your achievements should give you the marks that you've asked for. OK, the only people who will be asked to upload the evidence is those who are shortlisted based on their MSRA score. So if you haven't met the cutoff for the MSRA in terms of meeting the required uh, lower score, you won't be asked to upload your evidence. So you may be asked right now to score yourself. You'll then do the MSRA. But then if your score isn't good enough, you won't be then invited to upload your evidence. OK, once you've uploaded your evidence, the assessors will then go through what you've submitted and they will outline what they think your score should be, whether it goes up or whether it goes down. And interestingly, they will be now looking at your white space answers to try and get a bit more context as to why you deserve those marks. You got to remember, it used to be the case that there was a portfolio station or interview where you could kind of have a conversation with the interviewers and be like, OK, this is why I've given myself full marks for the audit and they'll be like, okay, blah, blah, blah. And they'll be like, yeah, I agree. Or they would ask you a bit more probing questions to try and elicit why you think you've given yourself the marks. They didn't have that feature for the last several years, but with these short white space answers of like a hundred words, they're trying to get a bit more context as to your evidence. It's not gonna be marked per se, it's going to be used by the assessors to be like, OK, now I understand why Mohammed said he deserves full marks for commitment because he's talking about his two taste of weeks and why they fundamentally differ. Critically, you can't amend your score after you submit your application. OK, you can't be like, oh, crap, uh, I don't know how, but I just randomly found out I am a first uh, named author in a radiology publication. Let me quickly go on Oriel and just change it. It's too late, okay? You can't. Potentially, you can, when the evidence comes uh, to being uploaded, you can submit your more uh, robust evidence, for example, the first author publication, and hope, keyword is hope, that the assessors bump you up, okay? It may not happen because they were like, why didn't you mention this when you self-verified, but it has passed. The other thing is, completed achievements count all right if you are set if you've just sent a abstract for a poster yesterday you can't claim marks for the poster presentation or a oral presentation it hasn't happened yet and therefore you can't get marks for it the only thing you can get marks for when it comes to pending things is abstracts that have been accepted for a conference and you have evidence of that acceptance and secondly, uh, publications that have gone through the peer review have been accepted, but are still in press. When I say in press, I mean that they've been accepted, but they're not being published just yet. They'll be published in December's edition of Clinical Radiology, okay? Or in January's edition of the BMJ. So it's been accepted. They're really happy with your work, but they're just like, we're not publishing it just yet. Once again, those things will be accepted, but you have to have evidence of it. Please do not overclaim, all right? There is a box or a section of the assessment where you on Oriel will say, I am aware that I am not falsifying my achievements. And if I do so, my probity may be questioned. And it has happened in the past. We are aware of some candidates where the assessors have kind of got a bit suspicious about candidates overclaiming in multiple domains, basically uh, raising suspicion that you're falsifying information because at the end of the day, you're doctors, you have to maintain professionalism and probity is one of those key professional tenants. So don't be that person 
who, rather than getting a portfolio score back, gets their probity questioned, and then that escalates to potential GMC involvement. You can claim for achievements in multiple domains. For example, you have done a, a publication, which is then presented. Okay, those count as both publication and presentation. Maybe your publication won the best prize. That can count across multiple domains. Similarly, if you have done a uh, audit presentation in a radiology themed project, that can show as commitment to the specialty, all right? Achievements in the last 10 years, so basically from 2014 onwards count, 2013, 2012, don't bother, it won't even get looked at. And fundamentally, one of the big differences uh, for this year is you can only submit four pieces of evidence for each domain. The reason why, as we outlined in our newsletter, is because everybody was dumping information into every domain possible. They're like, okay, I think I looked at an audit three weeks ago. I'm going to put that in my audit domain. And the assessors because of the volume of applicants kind of got a bit pissed off. They're like, this is too much information. You can't just wing it and shotgun approach this. You need to be very strategic in the evidence. So they've said, okay, no, we're only gonna let you upload four pieces of evidence for audits, for commitment, for publications, for teaching, for leadership. And those four things are gonna be your top four achievements in that domain where you try to outline why you deserve the marks you do, all right? Because the people were just kind of abusing this and dumping as much information as possible, as much evidence, and the assessors don't have time to scrutinize every piece of evidence. The assessors basically look at what you've achieved, look at the top domain. If it matches the top marking descriptor, they move on. They give you the marks and move on. They're not gonna start reading into it, okay? The portfolio domains haven't changed. They are changing next year, which we'll cover at the end. But as of now, these are the seven portfolio domains. They haven't changed from last year. In terms of commitment to specialty, one thing you should be aware of is what constitutes a significant exposure. It's there for you in black and white. Don't try to read into it and then justify why you think your thing shows commitment to the specialty. It's not gonna work. Me, Uzi and Jamie are not involved in the assessment process. So whilst we are on your side, we're not gonna guarantee you're gonna get the marks. So one of the big questions that has recently come through is do MDTs count? Because last year they said three MDT attendances did count. This year it's not mentioned. So with that being said, don't presume it will be accepted. They've told you categorically, this is what we constitutes as significant exposure, a taste a week or an observership placement, a student selected component, elective or a, like a radiology component as part of your degree. Like you did some imaging as part of your master's in research. You've done a clinical project, for example, a uh, systematic review or a literature review, whatever in radiology. Don't be like, no, 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 I'm also going to do three day MDT. It's not going to count. Just Make your life easier and be like, okay, if this is what they want, this is what I'm going to get. When you do a taste a week, and this is something we get asked so often, so I'm going to be very black and white about it now. When you do your two taste weeks, they have to be fundamentally different. The best approach we give you is do one in diagnostics and one in intervention, because no one can dispute that they are fundamentally different and different experiences altogether. It's not about, oh, I did one in a district general and I did one in a tertiary level. That's not what we're talking about here. Because if you do diagnostic in a district general and then in a tertiary hospital, your experiences are gonna be fundamentally the same. Let's say you have two diagnostic taster weeks, do them in two or three different specialties. So for example, your first taster week could be general musculoskeletal neuroradiology. The second taster week you decide to do in uh, pediatrics, GI, and breast. By showing those differences, you're making the assessor's life very easy where they'll say, okay, taste to week one was this, taste to week two was this. They're two different ones, full marks, off you go, okay? But please don't try to beat around the bush and try and like 
uh, kind of twist the evidence because the assessors will see right through it. Similarly, you can do a course if you're struggling to uh, show evidence of uh, exposure to radiology. And once again, we do have courses on our website. Go on radcast.co.uk, check out our radiology crash course if you want to do one that that is one day in length okay and obviously conferences count but if you're going to go down the taste to week route they have to be fundamentally different so like i've said just to reiterate fund, uh, taste to weeks have to be fundamentally different they've added new qualifying exposures one of the big ones that happened last year which hasn't changed this year is the reintroduction of courses and conferences and courses are included so please we do have some uh, ones on our website. Now, one of the things that they've added to this part of the portfolio on Oriel is a hundred words where you have to say how your evidence has shown your commitment to clinical radiology. Once again, we don't think these are gonna be marked because they should have outlined this marking to you, but it's just a, a giving you an opportunity in a hundred words to be like, okay, I've done multiple taste weeks. I've shown different exposures to radiology. I did a uh, elective in radiology in some very nice part of the world. And you can kind of give a bit more context to your evidence because unfortunately, not until next year, you don't have an interview uh, portfolio component. When it comes to leadership and management, Nothing has fundamentally changed. Unfortunately, it's a bit too late to be kind of working on this domain because you've had to have done it for six months, okay? So if you do have something that meets this domain, please make sure your evidence is on point. It must state your name, like please don't just be like Dr. Khan, be like Dr. Muhammad Khan, make it, even put your GMC if you want, because it has to be very specific, all right? Remember, your job in the portfolio is to make the assessor's life as easy as possible. So if you start to include everything that they've asked for, they will just give you the marks and move on. You don't want them questioning your evidence. If they start to question your evidence, it's probably because they're a bit uncertain as whether it meets the requirements. So they're gonna mm and ah, and potentially you may not get the marks. State the role, state what you did, all right? Don't just be like, oh, Dr. Khan for six months was the uh, president of the Clinical Radiology Society at Liverpool. And what did Muhammad do as the president, okay? That type of thing. For those of you that are preparing for future applications, here are some opportunities like IR Juniors, an amazing society. They often do recruit for their committee. I'm not sure if the recruitment is finished at the moment, but do check them out. Then you have things like hospital mess, president, hospital mess lead, postgraduate lead. Maybe you want to take an educational role for the foundation doctors. That's leadership and teaching. Rotor coordinators, probably the worst job ever to take up, but it's still evidence of leadership. Of course, speak to your nearest undergraduate radiology society. They always love doctors helping out in terms of delivering teaching. Once again, teaching domain, but you can also take a leadership position where you can help like try and develop a curriculum for the medical students. And of course, remember, it doesn't have to be clinical. It can be non-clinical. For example, you are a volunteer, you do sports, all of these things do count. And once again, they've given you a hundred words to elaborate on the role. Once again, it's to give you an opportunity to justify why you deserve the marks. So just give a nice succinct description of that role, what you did, what you achieved and why you deserve the marks. When it comes to teaching and training, no changes once again. Uh, it must have been for three months in total. Uh, but critically, make sure you have the documentations like a letter saying that you did X, Y, and Z, um, and that if you have been delivering teaching, you must have like a summarized feedback of your teaching. You can't, don't please don't put all of the feedback forms in. Just put a summarized feedback saying, okay, overall, the 30 trainees who attended your lectures thought you were amazing in teaching chest x-rays or something. And once again, there's a hundred words where you can very uh, succinctly outline what you've done and how this will support a career in clinical radiology, okay? These aren't challenging questions. 
and something that you should be very easily like describing and just summarizing in terms of, okay, I did this teaching. I know teaching is a fundamental role of a clinical radiologist and therefore I deserve these marks. Formal teaching, no changes again. And if, for example, if you have developed a portfolio where you become a fellow of the Higher Education Academy, that does count as well. And when it comes to audit and qualifications, this is one of the major changes this year in terms of how you get the evidence, all right? In terms of the way it's scored, it's the same as previous years, but critically, and this is something you have to be aware of whilst you're collecting your evidence now, the evidence they want to give you the points has significantly changed. So they've stated for you in black and white that the evidence required to get marks for any audit or any quality improvement project is a letter from the supervising consultant stating your involvement, okay? And to make your life easier, please just use the wording in the descriptors for the scoring, all right? So when you write that letter for your consultant, use the word for word. So once again, your assessor's life is easier. Number two, you need to state the consultant's name and GMC number, the date of the letter. And remember, evidence dated after the application window closes on Oreo will not count, all right? So make sure you've done this before the application deadline. And then thirdly, with that evidence, you have to put the audit pre presentation in terms of what you delivered at the, uh, like for example, the local uh, audit uh, meeting. This is very similar to core surgical training, and it's mainly being done to make sure people aren't kind of fudging their evidence and just uploading an audit presentation and saying, yeah, I did a full cycle. They just made a presentation potentially, okay? So once again, if you do not have this evidence, use this time to go and get it. You should not be struggling in this domain. If you're struggling for audit ideas, go on RCR Audits Live. They have plenty of templates that you can copy and paste. Audits that are done in the acute setting are more easier and quicker to conduct than a lengthy audits in more subspecialty niches, okay? So critically, scoring is the same, but the evidence required has fundamentally changed. Okay, make sure that it's a full cycle. Don't just do a half cycle. It's so easy to complete the cycle once you've done half the work. Make sure it's radiology related and make sure you've done two as a minimum, okay? And once again, there's a 100 word white space answer where you can kind of expand on your project and kind of talk about what you did, how it's linked to radiology and critically, please make sure this is included, what your role in the audit was. In terms of academic achievements, once again, there are a few changes here, which I wanna kind of highlight, but it's very similar to uh, previous years. However, once again, there are no integrated degrees. This is now the second year in a row where they've not given any additional points for integrated degrees. A non-research postgraduate qualification potentially a PG cert and medical education is now worth four points. Before it was last year, it wasn't even mentioned as additional points. It was just not qualified at all. But this year they've put specifically a non-research postgraduate qualification. So once again, you may get points in both the teaching domain and the academic domain as well. A case report last year, both related to radiology and not related to radiology, scored a blanket one. This year, and we are quite happy with this change, if it's related to radiology, you'll get three points. And if it's not related to radiology, you'll get two points. Now, what does related to radiology mean? Anything that has imaging, all right? I'd be very surprised if you've done a case report that has no imaging whatsoever. In fact, I would be saying you're very unfortunate Okay, most medical pathologies now have some form of imaging somewhere in the process. So most of the time it'll count for three. Letters to the editors, it's now mentioned separately and these only get one point. Okay, so a letter to the editor uh, just gets one point. In terms of domain seven, 
uh, which is the final domain. One of the things that we were informed about basically yesterday, and we noted that on the website, this actually changed, uh, I think two days ago, is that they have removed this distinction for medical degrees. Now, last year, you were awarded top marks if you had a prize awarded by Radiology Institute, or you had a distinction or equivalent in your primary medical qualification. Now, the issue with this was, and this is something that happened, uh, we were made aware of, is that the assessors found it very difficult to standardize this because especially with our international colleagues applying, there are different criteria for distinction, honors, whatever you wanna call it, across the medical schools in the world. So they found it difficult to standardize how this was awarded because different universities have different criteria. Are they the same? Should it be uh, a universal uh, marking for all of them? So to make it more streamlined and standardized, they have removed it, okay? Similarly, um, in terms of um, what does that mean if I do have a distinction, we're not sure, and this is being us honest, where does that now fit in? Because you could say, okay, maybe I can only get one mark, which is the local organization, because a local organization, as per the description, is a single university. However, we are unsure whether a distinction is equivalent to a prize. There is no harm in trying because the only thing that could potentially happen is your marks go down by that one mark. So if you wanna put forward your distinctions, it's up to you, but we're not sure how they view medical distinctions now, whether it counts as a one prize awarded by a local organization or meeting, but it has been removed from the prizes and awards. Previously, it got top marks. This year, it's not been mentioned at all. And of course, uh, if you've signed up to our uh, application course, you are uh, eligible to enter into our best radiology reflection national prize. Once again, it outlines, but this time 75 words on the work you did. Once again, the reason why they've added this is because they just want to get a bit more context as to your prize. So say, for example, you won the, uh, I don't know, RCR's prize for an essay. Outline it, outline what you did and what you potentially won. Like, was it a voucher? Was it a trophy? I don't know. But put that in your white answer. Two additional elements to the application, which you should be aware of. One of them is this IR pathway. It's been now for, I think, three years in a row. And basically, you can now, at the point of application on Oriel, outline that I want to do IR. Now, it allows the training program directors and the head of schools to realize, okay, we have three incoming SD1s who all say they want to do IR. We need to make sure that if all three say they want to keep doing IR, typically after SD3, 4, we have spaces for them. So it's more of a uh, prospective planning opportunity for the training program directors and the head of schools. But it doesn't mean that you're now forced to do IR. If you say, no, you know what, I'm kind of sick and tired of wearing lead, that's cool. You can go back to more diagnostic radiology pathway. And similarly, if you don't get an IR pathway and you want to do it, that doesn't mean you can't ever uh, do IR because that would be a bit ridiculous. You can still say once you've done the required uh, training competencies, got your exams, uh, typically the 2A, you can be like, now I want to do IR. If there's a space, well and good, you can join, but it's not restricting you to one path or the other. It's just mainly for the TPDs and the head of schools to plan prospectively as to what their trainees are inclined or inclining to do. Now, finally, I just want to talk about briefly the major changes coming to the year after 25 to 26. Not this year. This year is 2024 to 2025 recruitment cycle. The year after is 2025 to 2026. We think this is one of the best things that they have done in terms of application information. They've told you potentially vaguely, but they've given you something that these are the changes that are coming, get ready for them. 
So number one, they're going to get rid of two domains. They're getting rid of the uh, prizes and awards, and they're getting a merger between the teaching and training and the formal teaching qualifications. This has happened in other specialties. Uh, core surgical training has had a huge shakeup in terms of what they award in terms of the portfolio. They're going to reintroduce the portfolio station. I had it back when I applied, where I was given 10 minutes to discuss my achievements across the portfolio domains with an interviewer, which I thought was great because it allowed me to justify why I have the score I do for the domains I have. And because of now there's going to be reintroduced to interview, they're going to get rid of the online portfolio verification process. You'll now have to do it with an interviewer. They'll probably ask you a few probing questions. And I think you've kind of been given an insider clue as to what those will be. For example, talk me through your audit. That could be a interview question in a portfolio station. Similarly, what is the evidence you have for commitment? That's an, another excellent portfolio-based uh, station question, okay? Why is it relevant to you? Well, if you're stressing about prizes now, and unfortunately you don't get in, you don't have to worry about it afterwards. So it's kind of telling you, okay, you've got this one opportunity now this year to get all this information that we want, but thereafter we're going to change it and we're telling you now so you can kind of get ready for it. In terms of maximizing your application, please just get in touch with us. We'll try and do what we can. Yes, it is a busy time of uh, the year for us, but we will get back to you uh, as quick as we can. Portfolio is now worth 40%. It's so critical. You get every mark you physically and possibly can to bump up your score. Interview is going to be the big uh, crux of your ranking, 60%. And of course, when you are shortlisted, we will then be inviting candidates to book onto our one-to-one -one, uh, interview sessions. We're going to probably do that in February next year. It's too early to be doing interview prep. You should be doing MSRA prep with the resources, eMedica, MCQ Bank, uh, Pass Medicine. And similarly, you should be getting those final portfolio marks. As soon as the portfolio deadline is done, move on. MSRA till the date of your exam, okay? But if you have any questions, uh, please start putting them in the chat now. We'll try our best to get through them and get in touch with us at hello at radcast.co.uk. So yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen. I will also stop the recording.